So in the last part of the course, we're going to look at uh, different use cases of blockchain technology. What's it, what's it actually good for? Uh, in particular, we'll look at financial applications uh, as these are, are sort of the most prominent. Uh, we'll look at things like decentralized finance or DeFi. And um, before we you know, get there, uh, one of the, the probably the most important use cases is money itself. So it's sort of obvious that, that Bitcoin's original design goal was uh, as a currency, we call them cryptocurrencies or as, as money, um, but it's worth reflecting for at least part of a lecture on whether Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, Ether and others, uh, they actually you know, perform the functions that we would expect from money. So the original design goal Of Bitcoin was money and if you go ask an economist hey what, what do you expect when you when I tell you that something's money I, I'm going to try and convince you that that gold is money or I'm going to try and convince you that that housing you know houses have value you can transfer them from person A to person B right so why don't we use houses as, as a form of money and the economist will say okay that that sounds promising at least because there's some value associated with it but you know in order for it to, to really function as money we it needs to have something beyond just being valuable okay and in particular what we look for are, are three kind of key features So features or properties. Okay, so they're called, uh, the first one's called medium of exchange. The second one's called the store of value. And the third one's called a unit of account. So I'm gonna go through each of these uh, one by one and we'll say what it is and then we'll, we'll think about whether cryptocurrencies have this property or they don't have this property. It's usually not a binary thing like they, they, do, they do or not. It's think of it more like a grape. You know, they, they, they're really well you know there it's an a plus on medium of exchange but it's not so good on a story value it's maybe a c and you know it's maybe a a, a, a b minus or something on unit of account okay so medium of exchange So this property basically says, you know, uh, a, a currency, you know, it, it needs to circulate, right? People need to be willing to accept it. You need to be able to walk in a store and say, hey, can I, can I pay you in Bitcoin instead of paying you in Canadian dollars? And the answer might be yes or no, but, but the person that's making that decision, one of the things that they're considering is, okay, I, I take this Bitcoin from you. Can I, can I turn around and use it? Right? Am I am I confident that it's going to have value? Uh, and so if I if I try and give it to someone else, I, I take it from you uh, with the purpose of I want to go out and buy something with it or, or give it to someone else that I owe money to. And are they going to accept it? Right. And so as long as I'm confident that other people will accept it, then I'm going to be more willing to accept it myself. So I'm confident that others will accept it. So I will accept it. Now, if you're creating a currency from scratch, 
and let's say it's not a cryptocurrency let's say it's a it's an actual government currency so governments do this occasionally um, or sometimes they refresh uh, their currency uh, for, for a variety of reasons I won't go through but if we think about like the olden days you know you know hundreds and hundreds of years ago how is it that governments you know sort of bootstrapped this idea how did they build confidence that people uh, would be willing to accept it uh, because someone else would be able to, to, to accept it. So MOE is just medium of exchange. Okay, so they're going to bootstrap it by, first off, they're, they're going to get it into circulation. And so one thing that governments have to do is they have to pay people. Okay, there's people that are on the staff of governments or if we're thinking of hundreds of years ago, the, the, main, uh, the main destination of government money would be soldiers. Uh, and so government employees and soldiers are paid in it. So this gets it out into circulation. So it creates a supply of the money. And then the government say, hey, every year you got to pay us taxes and we want the taxes in this money. Okay, so if, if you're not being paid in this currency, Right. Just know that that at the end of the year, you're going to have to pay your taxes in this currency. So what, however you're getting paid, you're going to have to convert it. Or maybe you should go to your employer and, and tell your employer that you want to get paid in this currency since you're ultimately going to have to pay taxes. And they are, too. Right. And so that's uh, a way of uh, inducing demand uh, for the currency. And the idea is that that hopefully everyone would sort of switch over uh, to using it. This creates demand. It also solves the original problem. So you're confident that at least one other person will accept it, which is the government, uh, which you have to pay taxes to. Okay, so you're you're more likely to, to receive it because you know, well, at least I can turn around and pay my taxes in it. But also everyone else has to pay their taxes in it anyway, so I probably can, can offload it to someone else. Okay. No one wants to be the last person stuck holding a currency, right? Everyone decides, oh, that currency isn't used anymore. It's not valuable anymore, and you're stuck with a bunch of it, and you you can't do anything with it, right? If if you're if you're confident that you're able to do something with it, uh, then then it it uh, uh, is good on medium of exchange. Now you can take this a step further, and you can say, hey, any legal contract that you write. The person, if they're a citizen of the country, they have the right to say, I want to be paid in this government currency. So you can still write a contract for other um, uh, currencies, right? But if the person shows up and says, hey, I'm, I'm paying the equivalent amount in the government, you, you have to accept it by law. So this applies to, to employment contracts, you know, loans, anything, anything like that. Uh, so we call this legal tender. Uh, if, if money has this property, it's called legal tender. And this also creates demand. Okay, so that's fine if you're a government. But what if we're doing a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin? Uh, we're doing it from scratch. So there's no, uh, there's no one in charge. There's no government. Uh, you know, to a certain extent, there might be a foundation that runs it. So maybe you could pay your employees in Bitcoin to get it out there. Uh, we know that it's given to miners. And so we uh, we're able to create the supply of Bitcoin. So the, the supply isn't the problem uh, with Bitcoin. The question is, who creates the demand, right? Why, 
you know, why would I accept Bitcoin if I can't turn around and, and give it to someone else, right? What, what um, you know, what, who, who is that friend that I know will always accept Bitcoin from me, right? Uh, and so the answer is that, that cryptocurrencies, they kind of evolved, right? At first, there was only a few set of people in the world probably that would accept Bitcoin. Right. They were enthusiasts about the currency. They believed in it or something like that. It wasn't generally accepted. OK. And then acceptance got wider and wider and people, you know, they liked the technology. They saw that it wasn't a scam and people became more confident. And I wouldn't say that we're at the point today where, where everyone's going to accept Bitcoin. Uh, you certainly can't walk into any store and, and, and try and pay in Bitcoin. But there, there is one kind of service that you can always use that, that's very, very important. Uh, which is an exchange service. So an exchange service will convert your Bitcoin to you into Canadian dollars, okay, or vice versa, all right? So technically you should be willing to accept Bitcoin because you know at the worst case, even if I can't find somewhere to spend it, uh, I can go to one of these exchange services and I can exchange it. Uh, for Canadian dollars. Now, at the same time, there's some friction involved in that, right? I have to register with them. I have to give my ID. There's going to be some fees. I have to like mentally like figure out how to do it. Um, and so I'm not saying that you would still be willing to accept Bitcoin um, or at least maybe at, at the same rate that you would accept Canadian dollars. But if someone said, hey, I'll, I'll pay you a certain amount in Canadian dollars, I'll give you double the value in Bitcoin. Right, to compensate you for, for the friction that's involved in, in converting it back to Canadian dollars, you know, there, at some point there's a premium uh, that you'd be willing to pay uh, in order to, to accept the cryptocurrency if you're confident that these exchange services will continue to exist. Okay, so they've existed for many years in Canada. They're regulated by the government. There have been scams uh, with them. Uh, there have been exchanges that have, you know, gone belly up, you know, one of the uh, one of the famous cases in Canada is called Quadricex. I, you know, suggest that, that you go in and read about it if you're interested. Uh, there's a, a, a pretty good documentary on Netflix as well. Uh, if you called, I think it's called Crypto King or, or something related to Crypto King in the title. Um, and so anyway, so so, you know, you're not 100 percent confident that these exchange services work, but uh, as long as you're, you know, 99% confident or something like that, there, there will be people that are willing to uh, accept it. Okay, so cryptocurrency is, you know, if we were to give it a grade on how well does it fulfill medium of exchange, I, I would say it's okay or good. It sort of passes, right? So it's it passes uh, medium of exchange. Okay, you can find people that accept it. Not everyone, but you can find people. And if you can't, you can find an exchange service that will convert it for you to gain dollars. It's going to be some friction. So it's it's not as easy as, say, taking US dollars right there. You can walk to an ATM and you can put it in and, and Canadian dollars will get put into your bank account. So it's not quite at that level of frictionlessness. So it's, it, you know, so it still has a ways to go. Uh, it could be better, uh, but but it, it operates fairly well uh, as a medium of exchange. Uh, also, because it's a cryptocurrency, you can transfer it digitally. There's no borders uh, that are involved on the Bitcoin side or on the cryptocurrency side. Um, and so there, there are other you know, payment vehicles that you might use that, that, that also have a lot of friction that are involved. So one of them would be sending money overseas uh, to another country. Uh, that, that can have a lot of friction as well. And so even though there's some friction you know, associated with cryptocurrencies, it, it could be the case that in those kinds of scenarios uh, that, that crypto is, is less, uh, cryptocurrencies are, are sort of, they have less friction uh, than, than the existing methods. Okay, so the next uh, property is store of value. So the idea of store of value is it, it sort of is a nice extension to medium of exchange. So medium of exchange basically says, OK, I'll accept that currency because I'm confident I can give it to someone else. But what that ignores is the question of when, 
when am I able to turn around and spend it? So it, it might be true that I'll receive the currency. There will be someone that's willing to accept it, but it might take a day, a week, a month, you know, in order to, to, to make that payment to that person or before I have to make that payment to the person. And what if the value of this goes down while I'm waiting, right? Um, then, you know, even though it satisfies meaning of the exchange because that other person exists, it's kind of, it's, it's not great for me because, you know, I'm losing value, you know, as I, I sit on, on the money before I'm able to spend it, okay? Um, so meaning of the exchange, you know, is really only useful if uh, when you receive money, uh, you're able to wait a certain amount of time and not have the value of the money change. I'll put a reasonable period of time because uh, we all know that, that prices do creep. Uh, up or down, you know, over decades, right? We know that, that things were a lot cheaper, say in Canada, you know, groceries and things like that were cheaper 30 years ago or 50 years ago in nominal terms, right? In terms of, of the actual amount that's written on the loaf of bread, uh, for example. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that that term nominal amount that when we talk about unit of account. Um, but, but, but anyways, okay, so when you receive money, you, you can wait a reasonable period uh, without its value changing or changing much, okay? So you, you want a kind of stable price, right? So I get some money at time t, and of course the price will go up and down a little bit. Now you have to think about what this is relative to. Right, so maybe relative to another currency or relative to the price of a good or something like that. Um, but there, there will be some fluctuations, uh, but if, if they're not too dramatic, uh, we say that the currency is stable. Now, what we don't want is, uh, we're not crazy about the situation where you know the, the price is gonna go down or maybe on an extreme, it goes down a lot, right? Um, so we call this inflation. And inflation tends to happen over time, over you know decades or years. And you know even now as I'm recording this lecture in 2022, there's a lot of talk about inflation. And there's some countries in the world where, where uh, the value of money decreases very, very quickly, rapidly. And we call that hyperinflation. Right, so this tends to happen when, uh, for example, you, uh, or, or a property of this is, you know, you receive payment, you, you really need to spend it within a day. If you even wait a day, it could be worth half of, of, of what it uh, is supposed to be worth or, or what it was worth when you received it. Okay, grocery stores will update their prices maybe once a day, right? They'll walk around once a day, or maybe it's a computerized system or something like that. But, but anyways, okay. Now there, there's the alter, the alternative uh, scenario, uh, which is called deflation. So that's the idea that the price of the, of the uh, money would go up. Okay, and you might think at first glance that hey, that's great. I, I would love a currency. You know, if I buy it today and then I just don't do anything with it. I put it under a mattress and I come back 10 years later and it's worth more uh, than it was when I bought it. That That's fantastic, right? So you might think that deflation is, is a good thing, uh, but but we'll address that in a second and, and I'll try and argue why it's it's not good. You don't want either deflation or inflation. You, you want a, a currency that's at least reasonably stable. So let's deal with the inflation case first. So if we have high inflation, essentially you no longer want to receive the currency.
because you have to spend it right away. Or it will lose value. Uh, you wouldn't save it, okay? So savings in a country, uh, at least in that currency where there's inflation, hyperinflation, high inflation, uh, you know, you don't find people. There's there's no point in saving your money. Okay. And so that can have ripple effects in the economy because people, you know, things happen, something happens to your house and you don't have any money saved. Uh, to deal with it because why would you save uh, because the value is, is decreasing so quickly. And then the most important thing has to do with lending, uh, which is something you don't always think about, uh, but, but lending is, is really important uh, in the economy. And if you have high inflation, uh, you don't want to lend someone else money. And you, in this case, you could be a person, you know, like think about giving a loan to a friend or something like that. Um, but also you, in this case, could be an institution like a bank or something like that. OK, uh, uh, so you won't lend cash. And the reason you won't lend it uh, is because uh, if you lend it, uh, you're going to get repaid. And when you get repaid, uh, it's going to be. Sorry, my uh, because when you get repaid, uh, the value of it will have decreased. So you're you're going to loan someone you know, $100 and that will buy you, you know, I don't know, 50 loaves of bread. And when you, you'll get $100 back, you know, maybe in six months, right? But now the value of that $100 has gone down and it only buys you, a, you know, two or three loaves of bread or one loaf or not even one loaf. In, in the case of hyperinflation, it, it could decrease to, to being basically worthless, okay? Um, so you won't lend cash uh, because you will... Uh, be repaid a smaller amount in terms of its true value. Okay, so you'll, you'll get the same nominal amount. It'll still be $100, but the $100 will be worth less. Uh, so the value will be smaller. Now in high deflation, This is the world where your money's going up and you probably think, oh, that's that sounds pretty good, right? If, if the value of my money keeps going up and going up and going up. The problem with it is you won't want to spend it, okay? Uh, so if you spend it, why would you spend it today if it's going to be worth twice as much in a couple weeks? Now, sometimes you might have to spend it, but you're not going to want to spend it, okay? And so this will lead to what we call hoarding. So people will just stockpile cash uh, because there's no point in spending it. And then a lot of discretionary spending will disappear. And then it will be hard for businesses to run uh, because no one wants to spend the money. They're, they're waiting until the last possible minute and, and only spending it you know, in, in emergency situations. Okay, so it's gonna really harm uh, the, the economy. And then the second thing is going back to lending. Okay, so here it's flipped around. So when you have inflation, nobody wants to lend the money. Uh, if you have deflation, no one will want to borrow it. 
Okay, why? Same reason uh, you're gonna have to repay it, uh, but now it's worth, let's say you, you borrow you know, $100,000 and you go out and buy a house, right? Uh, you're going to repay this over 20, 30, 40 years, right? Uh, but as you're repaying it, uh, the value of it increases, right? And so, you know, the, that $100,000 isn't worth one house anymore. Uh, $100,000 is worth two houses or four houses or 10 houses, right? And so the amount that you're repaying, you know, even though it, it's still $100,000, but what, what $100,000 would buy you uh, is it won't just buy you one house anymore, it's going to buy you, you know, 10 houses. And so it's sort of like you're borrowing to buy one house, but you have to repay uh, the, the, the cost of 10 houses uh, in order to get out of your loan or to, to repay your loan. So I'll say a, a greater value. So the, like I say, in nominal terms, it's it's the same amount, but that amount is has a greater value. Okay, and so think of all the lending. So so things like mortgages, basically no one would take out a mortgage. Okay, and so no one's buying houses unless that they have enough cash up front to to buy the house. Okay, and even then they're not going to want to do it because. They don't want to spend it. They want to hoard that money. Uh, you know, the car loans, so like big ticket loans. It could be small personal loans. As students, you might have student loans. Okay, so basically all of these things would disappear from the economy. Um, and if they all disappear, then, you know, a lot of home ownership goes away people's access to, to buying a car goes away, your access to getting a university education goes away. Uh, and so the, the basically the economy doesn't function, okay? So it sounds like a great idea at first glance, you know, to have money that just goes up and up and up, uh, but it, it ends up not really working. Uh, it doesn't give you all the, the kind of properties that we want uh, in, terms of, in terms of an economy. Okay, so what do governments do? So we'll, we'll talk in the next lecture about how they actually, you know, bring money into circulation, how they print money, quote unquote. Uh, but what governments do is they, they try and implement a, a policy, a monetary policy, where they target mild inflation. So you can think of like 4% or something like that as a number for, for what mild might mean. And uh, you might say, well, why, why don't they just go for pure stability? And there's a whole bunch of reasons why. One of them that, that's kind of neat, uh, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's important to understand because uh, you can also get, you know, screwed over by it as well, is uh, if you, let's say you have a recession in the economy. And so now companies, uh, you know, they, they can't pay their employees the same amount. OK, uh, normally, you know, so so if you had a stable currency, they would have to cut wages and people get, you know, very angry, you know, if, if their wage gets cut, uh, you know, psychologically, it's it's hard to accept someone saying, hey, we're going to pay you less this year uh, than we paid last year. We're used to, to raises uh, usually, you know, because you're usually becoming a better employee over time, more experience. And you would expect that your salary goes up, not that it goes down. OK. But with mild inflation, everyone's salary is actually going down, okay, in, in terms of, of what you can buy with your salary. So it's happening automatically. And so if a company wants to cut wages, they won't actually cut wages, they just won't give a raise, right? They'll keep everyone at the exact same salary. And then inflation uh, means that, that, that they're actually being paid less, okay? So it's sort of a more, you know, more psychologically acceptable because you're, you're still getting the same paycheck. OK, now, if you want to ensure that you're you're actually being paid the same amount, you expect your wages to go up with inflation. Right. And so we see this, you know, sometimes governments can be sneaky, you know, in terms of, of you know, things like minimum wage. Uh, you know, they, they don't 
it doesn't keep up with inflation. And so it's, it's actually almost like they're decreasing it, even though they're not changing the number. Uh, and so then people will you know, have to always go back and petition the government to increase you know, certain things, uh, certain wages and things like that uh, to, to keep up with inflation. You've probably heard the term keeping up with inflation uh, and, and that's what it means. Okay, um, so, so anyway, so that's sort of government policy. That's what they try to do. Uh, and uh, now what about cryptocurrencies? So in my view, my opinion, uh, cryptocurrencies fail as a store of value. And the reason is twofold. One is that the volatility, so the, the amount that it goes up and down, even if it's stable, you still don't want huge swings uh, in the money. Uh, and, but the volatility of cryptocurrencies tends to be high. And it's not just high, it's very high. Okay, I'll show you that in a second. And uh, the second thing is it, it does tend to be deflationary uh, so far. So that's not investment advice. It's, it, I'm not saying that fundamentally it's deflationary. Okay, it just it happens to have gone up, right? right? Everyone knows the story of Bitcoin. It was, you know, a dollar 10 years ago. And, and then, you know, now it's, you know, by the time you watch this video, I'm not sure what it is. In fact, what I'm saying right now might not no longer be true when you when you uh, watch this video. So I'm recording this in 2022. And so far, most cryptocurrencies look kind of deflationary, at least the major ones like Bitcoin and Ether. Uh, once you go beyond that, then there's lots of, of coins that have gone up and then gone down uh, as well. Uh, but so far, uh, you know, Bitcoin and Ether, you know, Every time in the news you hear about, you know, the price dropping, the news just gets excited when either the price goes up a lot, then they cover it, or the price goes down a lot, then they cover it. Uh, but there's there's many months that go by when it's not really doing much or it's going up a bit or it's going down a bit and it's not really in the news cycles. And so it's, unless if you watch the price, uh, it's, it's hard. And also prices are always relative to something else. So I'm talking about the price relative to a standard government currency like the US dollar. Um, but anyways, what we've seen is it, it is sort of deflationary so far. And so if we look at this, uh, you know, people are going to tell us uh, if it's deflationary, people are going to hoard it. Absolutely. That's exactly what we see. Right. There's lots of people that, that buy Bitcoin. They buy it as an investment. They don't actually use it. They don't want to spend it. They're scared if they spend it, then it's going to increase in value. And you don't see lending markets. OK, in DeFi, you see some lending that happens but they're usually short-term loans and they're usually used by speculators that are, are sort of creating speculative positions, okay? It's not like no one goes out and gets a mortgage in Bitcoin, right? I, you know, imagine you got a, a mortgage in Bitcoin 10 years ago uh, when Bitcoin was trading for a dollar, right? So you got $100,000 worth of, of Bitcoin as a loan and, and that's how much you have to repay. But now Bitcoin's worth, you know, 10 times as much, 100 times as much, 1,000 times as much. And so you're going to have to pay back 1,000 times as much. Um, so, so yeah, so we don't see any like large scale lending uh, in Bitcoin or ETH or other, uh, you know, major cryptocurrencies. OK, uh, so, uh, yeah. And then uh, on the point of volatility, I'll, I'll show you one picture. Uh, so this is from an article that, that we wrote uh, on stable coins, which is a topic that, that tries to address it. Uh, but I'll just drop this in the notes. And so you can see this is uh, the price of Bitcoin in green. And you can see the volatility is crazy relative to three currencies that we're showing here. Everything's relative to the US dollar, okay? So this is the Euro relative to US dollar, the exchange rate between the Canadian dollar and the Euro, and the, the exchange rate uh, between the British pound and the US dollar. Uh, and you can see that even though they go up and down a little bit, uh, it's nothing compared to what we see in Bitcoin, okay? Bitcoin is, is just 
out of this world uh, in terms of volatility. Okay. The other thing I, I would note is uh, if you stare really, really closely at this uh, yellow line, this is the British pound. And uh, right where I circled, it takes a little bit of a dip, what looks like a little bit of a dip here. But that was actually a super significant event for the currency itself. So it was when they had a vote on something called Brexit. I won't, I won't go into the details, but it had a huge uh, impact on the, the value of, of the British pound. And so that little dip was considered extreme volatility, right, uh, in the British pound. But relative to Bitcoin, it's, it's just nothing, okay? Um, so yeah, so, so cryptocurrencies as general, they're gonna fail in my view as, as a store of value, at least today uh, from what we've seen. There's always the chance that, that the behavior changes in, in the future and, and people start using, you know, a cryptocurrency more as a currency and, you know, assets like a cryptocurrency, they tend to behave the way that people use them. So if people use them for speculation, then they'll, they'll look like a speculative instrument. If people use them uh, as a currency, then they'll look more and more like a currency. Okay, so the last property is unit of account. And it basically says, okay, do, do people use it for quoting prices? So if someone quotes you a price for a t-shirt, will they use, say, the, the price in Canadian dollars, right? Is it useful for that purpose? And so, I mean, this is so obvious for Canadian dollars that you don't even really think about it. So let's let's think about something else. Let's say that you were to accept gold, right? Would you say, okay, this T-shirt is this many ounces in gold? Well, what if the price of gold changes, right? Then then the price of the T-shirt is going to change as well, right? And then gold has some other awkward bits, like you have to measure it and weigh it, and you have to, you know, determine that it's real gold, et cetera, et cetera. So there's some friction. Uh, that's associated with it. Okay, so gold isn't a great unit of account, you know, A, because the prices change, and B, uh, it's, it's sort of awkward uh, in order to, to, to figure out what a unit of gold is, right? What's, you know, what, what's a t-shirt's worth in gold, and how do you measure it? Okay, uh, for cryptocurrencies, they're, they're a little better than gold, but, but not where they need to be. So I, I'm going to give it a grade of a, a fail, but a, I'll call it a soft fail um, because it's um, it's at least better than gold. What what tends to happen is you can actually go and buy things with Bitcoin. So I don't know that Expedia accepts, accepts it anymore, but uh, for for a while you could go and book a flight or a hotel in Bitcoin. And what they would do is they would say, okay, you know, a hotel room is not 0 0.0001 Bitcoin. Okay, that's that's not how it works. The hotel room is, you know, $100 Canadian, but what we'll do is we'll convert that into what the current price of Bitcoin is. We'll show you a quote and we'll say, you have two minutes to put your Bitcoin into this address. And if you do it in two minutes, then, then we'll consider it as being paid in Bitcoin. Uh, and then after two minutes, it will refresh and it will go and get another value and it will give you the current quote, okay? So you're, you're not using Bitcoin as the unit of account, it's still, you know, the thing is thought of, you know, your mental model for, for what something costs is still in terms of Canadian dollars, okay? But you're just given the equivalent and a spot exchange rate uh, with between Canadian dollars and, and the, the thing that you wanna pay with, uh, which is Bitcoin, okay? Now this is easy to do, it's super, you know, it's digital. You just look up the number in a database, you can compute it, a website can do it. You don't have to get out the weighing scales and measure it like gold or something like that, okay? So that's why it's, it's better, it's still better than gold uh, in terms of unit of account, but nobody's actually thinking uh, in terms of, of, of how much something costs. I mean, there was a time where you could buy a t-shirt and it had a set fix, a set fix price uh, in Bitcoin, uh, but, but no one operates that way anymore.
So they're accepted, but the price is in Canadian dollars and uh, converted on the spot. You know, and it sort of updates every two minutes or something like that. So you you know that that goes back to its volatility, right? If if I say okay, at the current exchange rate, this hundred dollar room, you know, that's so much Bitcoin, and you're like, okay, that's great, but then you wait five minutes on the on on the website, and then the price of Bitcoin goes say down, uh, then you're like, oh great, I'm going to get the room cheaper, right? And so they'll keep refreshing the rate. Uh, and two minutes is, is sort of standard. I've seen that used a lot, but it might not be exactly two minutes. Okay, so in summary, cryptocurrencies are kind of failing uh, as money. Now you might say, oh great, why did you wait till the end of the course to tell me this? Now now I know cryptocurrencies are garbage and you know they're it, you know why why are we even studying them? Okay. But just because it fails as money doesn't mean it's not worth something. Okay? Okay, there's there's lots of things that aren't money that are still very valuable. Gold, houses, stocks, right? These also fail the three functions of money. That doesn't mean that that they're not worthy of study or they're they're not an important component in the economy. And so one thing you can do is that you can use, especially in Ethereum's case, you can use the underlying technology, the, right, the blockchain technology, and you need ETH because you have to pay gas to run functions if, if you don't have some sort of onboard currency. Even if it's not a you know, good function of money, uh, you still need it you know, to some extent uh, for, for people to, to pay the fees, right? Um, then what you can do is you can introduce a new token on top of Ethereum and you can try and design it differently so that it does fulfill these functions of money. And so people have done exactly that. There's a class of tokens that are issued on blockchains like Ethereum. Ethereum is the most dominant, so I'll just say on Ethereum, but it could technically be on any other blockchain that gives you smart, smart contract functionality, even to Bitcoin to some extent. Um, but these uh, anyway, these these stable coins uh, that that's basically their design. They're, they're tokens that are designed to, to, to fulfill the functions of money. So you can a better cryptocurrency or one that's tied to money. Say more money like. Now maybe people don't want it, right? So so some people, I mean, they hold Bitcoin like because they think of it like a stock. Right. Or they, they buy Bitcoin because they think of it as a commodity like gold. OK, so maybe people want it. Maybe they don't. But you give them the choice. You say, OK, you can go buy the stable coin and it's going to have some of the functions of money. And you can go uh, you can go buy, you know, something like ETH or, or Bitcoin. And it's going to not exactly behave as money. It's not really an asset. It's not really a commodity. It's some 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 other thing. But, you know, if, if you want to speculate on its price, you know, go go right ahead. Now the other uh, the other question is uh, are cryptocurrencies overvalued? Uh, 
I mean, if, if they don't function as money, uh, Is it, you know, is the whole thing a big scam, right? Is it a big, some people say it's a Ponzi scheme. Uh, I, I really don't like that term applied to cryptocurrency because it, it's not true to what a, a Ponzi scheme is. I won't go into those details. Uh, but but a more sensible question, one that actually makes sense is you could say, okay, are, are cryptocurrencies a bubble? Uh, so sometimes we use the term bubble uh, to mean something that's uh, inflated in value. So they're just overvalued. And it's, it's not equivalent to saying that it's worthless. Okay, so case in point, you know, houses, you know, the housing market in 2008, say most recently, that was a bubble. It's, you know, in the US and in, in Canada. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, it just means houses were overvalued. So, so you could sell your home for a lot more than you should be able to. And if you bought new houses, it would cost you a lot more. You know, people were flipping homes, you know, going in renovating and, and it was, is you know, all, all this was sort of tied uh, to the fact that, that uh, there was a bubble in real estate. Um, does that mean that houses are worthless or once the bubble popped and then prices came back, does that mean you can go out and get a house for free or your house isn't worth anything? No, not at all, right? Houses are still worth a lot, right? They're still one of the, you know, biggest purchases that anyone would make. Um, you know, so a bubble just means that it's, it doesn't mean it's worthless, it just means that it's overvalued. Now back to the question, are cryptocurrencies a bubble? And uh, the answer is, I mean, no one, no one can tell you, right? You know, there, you'll find lots of economists and, and other experts uh, who say, yep, yeah, and you'll find lots of experts that say, nope, uh, it's, it's, it's not a bubble. And so I'm certainly not here as a computer scientist, you know, here to tell you, uh, but, but this is a, a reasonable question uh, that you might ask and logically it uh, makes sense. Okay, so that's it for now. And I'll come back or in the next video, we'll look at uh, central banks and how they generate money.